so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the second and the newly minted webinar series, Frontiers in Nanotechnology, virtual mini conferences hosted by the International Institute for Nanotechnology or the IAN. My name is Omar Farha and I am a professor of chemistry at Northwestern University and an affiliated member with the IAN. The IAN is a global hub of excellence that currently uh, unites over $1 billion in nanotechnology research, educational programs, and supporting infrastructures. We are hosting these virtual mini conferences on a regular basis until we are able to meet in person again. Next month, we invite you to join us for our next virtual seminar on September 8th. Today, we are pleased to have a group of distinguished researchers from across the globe who are making an impact on emerging nanostructured materials for clean air and water. Professor Po Wang from Beijing Institute of Technology, Professor Raul Banerjee from the India Institute of Science, Education and Research, Professor Laura Gardiardi from the University of Minnesota, and Professor Karina Chapman from Stony Brook University. We would like to thank our speakers for taking the time to be with us today. Just one announcement regarding the question and answer period. For those of you with video and audio access who wish to ask a question, please activate your video and unmute your audio at the start of the Q&A session to make us aware that you have a question. Otherwise, please keep your audio and video dis uh, disabled. For those without audio and video access, please type in your question in the Q&A tab found at the bottom of your screen. Now, I would like to invite my colleague and my co-chair for this webinar, Professor Will Dictal, to introduce our first speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Omar, for introductory remarks. I'd like to echo Omar's excitement about putting together this, uh, this program and how thrilled we are to have our four speakers with us today. Um, from all over the world. And so one of the silver linings in uh, our current situation is that uh, it's um, even possible to, to do this sort of thing without massive international travel. And so um, really pleased to see so many participants have logged in already. I, I see uh, almost 200 uh, already uh, in uh, uh, 200 attendees or so. and. Uh, and so I look forward to uh, the next uh, uh, few hours of science. So uh, with that, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Bo Wang. Uh, Bo received his uh, BS in chemistry from uh, Peking University uh, and then came to the United States for his graduate education. Uh, in 2006, he received a master's degree from Michigan uh, and then two years later, a PhD in chemistry uh, from, from UCLA uh, uh, associated with Omar Yagi's, uh, his advisor's move uh, from, from Michigan to UCLA. And that was actually a time where several of us were, were actually working in the same chemistry department in, uh, in the late 2000s. Uh, and, and so um, he has since been a professor at the School of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at the Beijing Institute of Technology. Uh, or, or since uh, 2011, that is. Um, and he now serves as a vice president of the Beijing Institute of Technology and a member of its academic committee. He is a national distinguished young investigator and his research interests focus on uh, crystalline framework membranes and films and other types of porous materials and porous composites for separations, purifications, uh, and capturing uh, toxic substances. So uh, please uh, joining me in, in uh, welcoming Bo Wang. And uh, we, we really look forward to your talk, Bo. Thanks for being here. Okay, uh, thank you, Will. Uh, thank you, Omar. 
Thank, uh, I would like to thank all of you. And uh, let me start sharing my screen here. Uh, just one second, let me see. All right, so can, can, can you see it, the screen? Yes, we can, Bill. All right, so, um, so uh, today I would like to uh, share with you some of our uh, research on the crystalline porous membranes and some films for filtration and catalysis. My name is Bo, Bo Wang uh, from Beijing Institute of Technology. Uh, I would like to start uh, discussing the, the, the grand issues uh, we're facing globally. One is energy issues. Uh, I guess the energy crisis as a chemist, when we talk about it, there are two major things we can, uh, we can work on. One is separation processes. As we all know, separation account for half of the total energy consumption of the whole industrial sector. As uh, uh, illustrated here in this Nature paper 2016. And also we, we all know catalytic processes actually can lower the whole energy demand, demands and uh, uh, boost the efficiency across all segments. So no matter how we're gonna work on this, separation and catalysis by themselves could be uh, the, actually the keys to address the energy crisis we're facing. Another thing is more kind of relevant, especially to some developing country uh, or to, I should say, especially in, in China now, nowadays when we're facing um, beyond the coronavirus, um, we were facing uh, this aerosol problem, which we usually refer to as PM 2.5. We have water problems, air problems, but PM 2.5 used to be a very uh, a severe problem. Uh, here is a paper from Nature in 2017. It analyzed uh, from Beijing to Shanghai to Guangzhou to Xi'an, four major cities in China, and analyzed the components in the PM 2.5. As you can see here, the composition actually range from all the way from organic matters to nitrate to sulfate to ammonium to chloride, all organic, inorganic. Uh, so many different species in this aerosol. So it's not pure particle. In itself, it can be very complicated. In order to actually prevent PM 2.5 from uh, generating from polluting the air, uh, we have to in actually come up with some new material being able to effectively f either capture or filter out different species, different compounds, and to make the air clean again. So we have to find a new material to do that. We know when we're talking about uh, those materials, especially those porous new crystalline materials like moth or cough, there are basically three major challenges when we're going down the stream. When we first talk about the connectivity, because we all know moth and coughs, they have the advantage that we can, we know exactly where those atoms are and how they're connected. But can we actually connect the atoms and the molecules the way we want? And especially can put it in the uh, specially arranged that we can actually anchor them or put them in the way uh, we really like it. So that's truly a chemistry, uh, new chemistry, or we, we should say it's a chemical problem. But once we get some new crystal, some new compound, is it stable enough to, so that we can call it a true material? So that's truly a kind of a material science or material engineering problem. But the next problem is probably we sometimes ignore, which is the processability. In order to actually turn such material to different devices, different filter, different membrane, different films, we have to make it more processable. Otherwise, it is still powder. So we have to make it before we can call it some type of application. Um, I would like to give several examples one is about connectivity. Can we link different things up, especially in the space, eventually we form a porous structure. Here we, we actually link a ferrocene as a building block and we introduce ferrocene as a building block to the framework. Eventually we use different building 
building units and link them up to form a pore structure. Unfortunately, so far we didn't get a very good uh, crystalline structure, but it is, it is highly porous. So the ferrocene can be put in the space in, and eventually nicely in the, in the space. We can actually space them up and then change the electrostructure of those porous solids. So that's one simple example as how we link things up. And also, can we use different building blocks? Here, actually inspired by Fraser's work on the CDMOF, uh, we are trying to use, and also Will's uh, beautiful work on uh, cyclodextrin on those beautiful framework stru uh, structures. Here, we use a very simple uh, uh, building unit, uh, gamma cyclodextrin as a building unit. But instead of link them up directly strong other covalent bond, here we use a, a interesting secondary building units. Here it's a spiral borate. Spiral borate is a, is a rather rigid uh, tetrahedron. Uh, if you use it to connect gamma cyclodextrin up, you get a rather highly crystalline structure, which is porous and crystalline. And in this case, we don't really have any other metals the only thing, and also you can actually change different cations to balance the charge. So it's, it can give you a rich chemistry regarding the guest host interaction here. But it's not enough, as we all know that a lot of cough and moth structures by themselves, no matter how beautiful they are, they by themselves are rather rigid frameworks. So when we, when we look at those powders, those nanocrystal line materials, they are rigid, they're hard to process. If we want to make a film, we want to make a membrane out of it, we have to make it rather flexible. The way, we, when we look at this problem, we think, well, can we link those rigid frameworks up with soft polymer chains through covalent bonds by this copolymerization process? So we learn actually from uh, simple polymer chemistry, they have this rod rod coil block copolymer. So can we use the moth cough particle as a monomer to copolymerize with other monomers eventually give you such structure so that we can have a rigid framework or rigid domains that can give you open channels and full accessibility to the active sites. And then those soft polymer chains can give you such flexibility and processability. So one example here, we use uh, a very uh, simple MOF here. It's a zirconium MOF UIO66. We graph the surface and then we treat such nanoparticle as a monomer and then react with another monomer. In this case, either a methyl methacrylate or butyl methacrylate as a, as a reactant. Eventually it copolymerized to give you a self-stand, self-support membrane and the good thing here is it's covalent bonded to each, those particles are covalent bonded to the polymer chain. So it's rather uh, anchored in space. And when you have such membrane comparing to the traditional uh, MMM or the mixed matrix uh, membrane, this membrane is rather uh, robust. The particles cannot move easily in the structure. So that gives you a rather uh, a robust membrane for different gas phase or liquid phase separation. And that's one example. Another one, one is when we're talking about stability. Here, when uh, we did a very simple, uh, uh, we, we tried a, a very simple approach to stabilize some MOFs. In this case, when we take a look at this MOF5 structure, it's very simple, it's easy to make, it's uh, relatively cheap. But the problem, as we all know, MOF5 by itself is not water stable. Even in the, in the, uh, when we put in, put in water after probably one hour or so, you are losing its porosity. The part of the structure actually is collapsing. But when we think about this zinc oxygen bond by itself, it should be strong enough. The reason it's not stable, water stable, is actually because this bond by itself is actually fully reversible. Water molecule is attacking the zinc 4O cluster. So can we repel water from the pores to make it stable? 
The answer is yes. One simple way actually inspired by Susumu's work, we actually absorb the monomer inside the pore. In this case, instead of uh, choosing other uh, alkyne or alkene uh, structure, here we choose a dialkyne uh, monomer through a very simple Bergman cyclization and then the radical polymerization, we can, uh, we can get a polyaniline, uh, polynaphthalene inside the channel. The reason we, we picked this polynaphthalene because it's, it's rather rigid. It's not actually going across the, those pores in different dimensions. Here, it, it behaves like a blade. It cut the channel to half. As you, as you can see from this uh, uh, pore, pore size distribution calculation, you can see actually when we, uh, upon increasing the polymerization degree, you can cut the pore all the way from 1.1 nanometer to 0.5 nanometer nicely, and it change dramatically that way. So you polymerize further, you cut the pore to half. And to cut the pore to half, you fully utilize the inner space, actually can nicely bond to carbon dioxide, but at the same time, it makes the whole structure hydrophobic, all the way from hydrophilic to hydrophobic. So water cannot enter the pore easily. So in that case, we actually mimic the smokestack gas from nitrogen, carbon dioxide saturated uh, with water. So without the polymer uh, inside, Actually, as you can see, it will be really, really hard to purge, to dry up the, 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 the column. But with polymer inside, eventually you can purge the Ma5 very easily. So it's, uh, it's uh, make it more useful in this separation processes. The next question is processability. From crystal to films, how we're gonna do it? Um, I showed this slides before. It's, um, we all say this inorganic plus organic links should be all the good stuff combined together. But the, my question is really, because when we take a look at those mouth cough powders, it's truly insoluble in almost any solvents. It's crystals. Uh, they're crystals. It's fragile and brittle and hard to fabricate or press process. So, we actually introduce a very simple way of making films or coatings on different substrates. Here we call it hot pressing method or hot method. It's truly the strategy where we eliminate, uh, eliminate solution. Instead of making it in the solution, we ma we're making MOFs, some MOFs without any solvents. We put the starting material, the powder, and we cast the, the powder on the substrates, and then we help press the surface. So you give energy directly to the material and you, it's actually in a very restrained space. It's confined space. The crystal cannot grow large. It you will get a nano crystalline thin film on the surface that way. So we call this method hop method. We can grow uh, some easy moths on those different structures, different surface very easily. And since it's a very simple method, in this case, we start from the powder and through hot pressing, we can grow on the fabric. So we use this method, we can go all the way to the row to row production because it's, you, can, you can, from one row, one side, you cast the powder on the surface. From another side, from the hot roller, eventually it will uh, roll up, roll on, and eventually give you different type of moth nanocrystal crystals co uh, covered on the surface of different substrates. We succeeded in making those in large quantities. We are making this nonstop, like 100 meter square per hour of this moth coating on different substrates using this method. We further actually uh, combine this method with some traditional membrane method, with, which is this uh, thermal induced um, phase separation processes. We mix with high density polyethylene and the uh, paraffin at the same time, eventually will give you a kind of uh, uh, elastic polymer uh, mix in that case. And then through a roller, you, you just put it into shape and put it into the film. And then we wash out using uh, dichromethane, 
you wash out the paraffin, it can give you a very nice membrane that way. In this case, we made 10 distinct MOF membranes through this row-to-row -row process, and it has up to 86% of MOF loadings. At the same time, the membrane by itself is very strong, and it can actually withstand high pressure. We use this membrane for gas separation and the liquid phase separation. And also, we uh, tried different other methods. In this case, it's electrochemical polymerization processes. But in this case, it's not crystalline. Uh, but we are trying to, trying to introduce different side chains. In this case, the softness adjustments of such rigid framework can give you a rather flexible uh, membrane. In this case, we get very, very soft, uh, flexible, robust membrane using this method for gas separation. Uh, now, let's move on to the separation part. When we, when, uh, based on different methods we just introduced, uh, we have different type of membranes, either cough membranes, CMP membranes, or some MOF composite membranes. For separation, the very uh, early example I tried, especially when we're facing these aerosols, we try to filter out the, the, the we try to filter out the PM2.5 or PM and PM10 from air. Uh, what we observed, especially for some of the, those MOF nanoparticles, when you make it small enough, you are facing a lot of static. Uh, I think we all experience such thing. When you make it small enough, you're experiencing the static electric effect. But when you are covering, covering on the surface of substrates using nano MOF particles, this phenomenon is even more pronounced. So we can use this, utilize this to actually capture the aerosol and attach it onto the surface of our membrane. At the same time, since MOF cavity, MOF pores can naturally uptake some of those pollutants from, from air, for example, SOX and NOx, eventually you can have such a membrane filter out PM 2.5, PM um, 10, at the same time, it can absorb some of those SOX and NOx into the membrane to clean out some uh, low concentration uh, toxic uh, condition. And also, when, when you have the pore smaller, in this case, CMP and the, some, some cough membranes, you can filter out, you can separate hydrogen from carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, and methane. In this, in this case, you can effectively actually separate hydrogen from it. So the, the, I would like to point out, separating those gas actually is not that hard, especially when we're talking about the pure MOF membrane. But when you are having a, uh, having a self-stand pure cough membrane or pure uh, flexible membrane, that will be more interesting because you can always make a final device out of it. In this case, we make a, 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 the, the, the fiber, in this case, using such self-stand membrane to separate hydrogen. So it will be easy to scale up the whole process. As you can see, this membrane by itself is rather uh, stable. It can withstand uh, high, uh, uh, like seven days nonstop separation. You can see the hydrogen um, is always uh, pure in this case. And uh, the, the, the other membrane uh, we mentioned before using that hot pressing method with 10 different MOFs, using that membrane because it's self-stand membrane in that case, you can see we can separate, of course, in this case, according to the pore size, we can separate different uh, dyes, dye molecules. And uh, when we introduce chirality to the, to, the, to the MOF structure, you can even use such membrane to separate uh, chiral compound. And also in certain cases, when you're using charged MOF or cough structure in this case, eventually you can separate protein according to its charge in different pitch level. So you can separate according to the, the physical properties using such MOF membranes. Uh, next, I wanna briefly uh, touch on this catalysis. It's actually, um, we're responding to the, 
to the um, actually we're collaborating with uh, different companies. Uh, they're talking about the high ozone um, concentration actually around us in certain cases in the airplane, uh, near the factory, near the printer, in the hospital, you are actually um, experiencing high ozone concentration problem. So how to decompose ozone? Ozone by itself is not hard to decompose, but you have to make it fast. So MOF can, will be an ideal candidate for such catalytic processes. And the, interestingly, when we use this IMOF MIL-100, uh, we are seeing here is it's directly related to the humidity level. So relative humidity level, when going down all the way to zero, the ozone conversion is really low. So it's very different from other metal oxide uh, behavior. So we did a little bit uh, calculation on this and we realized actually this whole pro process actually it's facilitated or enhanced by water uptake and uh, water release on this ion center. So it's, it, it's actually a very smooth process with water. Without water, the ozone cannot be easily converted to oxygen in this case. So MOF in, in this case actually beha behave very differently. And of course, use our uh, simple hot pressing method. You grow MOF on different, in this case, non-woven fabric. You can directly make a, a mask out of it for PM2.5 capture. And in this case, it's ozone decomposition. It's under very high uh, velocity, air flow velocity, you can decompose your ozone very nicely. And uh, lastly, actually, uh, we use this ferrocene uh, structure. Since it's porous and you have ferrocene in it, can, you, can we actually uh, do something about it? Actually, we analyzed the, the, the band structure of the uh, different ferrocene uh, framework we realized that under visible light, you can generate different type of active oxygen uh, species, either superoxide radical uh, or uh, hydroxide radical, or in, in, uh, in different cases, uh, hydrogen, pro uh, hydrogen peroxide. So you can always generate different type of active oxygen species. Can we utilize it to decompose, in this case, dye molecules? Uh, we, we test it it can actually decompose, oxidize some dye molecules. Can we further oxidize some warfare agent? In this case, it's a, a, it's a, a CES, it's, ver it's very close to the mustard gas. Uh, can we oxidize that to the less toxic uh, CESO? In this case, it's uh, sulfoxide. Instead of directly oxidize all the way to sulfone, we oxidize the structure to CESO. Under visible light, uh, use the CMP we just mentioned, the ferrocene. Eventually, you can decompose them nicely. And the structure by itself is highly stable. So when we coat it on the fabric, it can actually go across different runs all the way uh, to up to six, seven cycles. Of course, the per performance or the speed is rather slow right now. It's, uh, you have to wait for 30 minutes all the way to one hour in order to decompose. Not as fast as the one introduced by Omar, uh, Professor Fahar, uh, but we're trying to actually uh, understand the band structure in th those cases, try to tune it in the way we want, eventually to decompose different type of pollutants, uh, toxicants. Uh, in the last part, I wanna briefly mention the, one of the recent works we, we did using uh, those MOF membrane or those MOF filters for further um, uh, bios biocidal uh, purpose. In this case, we want to kill some of the bacteria. Uh, as well now, some of the MOF can uh, enter, uh, enter sunlight, can generate uh, different type of radicals. In this case, we tested all, all of them for E. coli uh, uh, process to kill the E. coli. In this case, we realized Z8 by itself is surprisingly good for such purpose. And uh, for Z8, we know that it's not in the, in the, in the neutral condition. Z8 by itself cannot generate um, a hydroxide radical. It can only generate superoxide uh, anion. 
And we, th that's the structure we actually analyzed. But when we're trying to do the in situ EPR, as you can see here in dark, in nitrogen, under nitrogen, you, you are not observing any zinc plus signal. But it, it is under, when you shine light on it, under nitrogen, you see the very uh, pronounced zinc plus signal here. But when you purge air into the chamber, the signal actually disappeared. So basically the zinc plus actually emerged and then you, it react with oxygen. Eventually oxygen give a, uh, uh, actually get another electron from zinc plus and it stabilize the whole structure. You get a superoxide that way. And we confirm the result using the uh, capturing agent DMPO to confirm the superoxide generation here. And also we analyze superoxide uh, according to the, uh, that's time actually from zero to all the way to two hours. You can see the superoxide radicals is generating gradually that way. And as we all know, superoxide lifetime is rather short it will either react with oxygen to give you hydrogen peroxide or it will further react with water to give you hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is accumulating in these cases. As long as you shine a light on, on, on Z8, it will give you hydrogen peroxide gradually. So use that hydrogen peroxide, we can effectively kill the bacteria in this case, in this case E. coli, to kill the E. coli effectively and it will give you a very nice mask. Uh, not only it can filter out some of the aerosol we're facing, and at the same time, it can kill the bacteria. Use that, actually, we did a little bit of work against coronavirus 19, uh, since we can mass produce such mouth filter in this case, and then we tested for different type of bacteria, virus, H1N1, and then we also tested for coronavirus. Uh, I need to point out, it's not the coronavirus, exactly the same coronavirus 19. It is very close to coronavirus 19. We're using the, the, the mice as a, actually using the mice blood, draw the mice blood, eventually uh, use that virus and to test whether malfilter can effectively kill the uh, coronavirus that way. And the efficiency is rather high and it can kill 99.9% .9 of the coronavirus. And uh, when you shine light on it within 30 minutes. So we can, we produce on different type of on, on, on fabric, on silk, on different uh, material. Eventually we actually produce some of the, the clothes uh, and also the mask. And we ship some of those to the hospitals and try to protect uh, our um, uh, doctors and protect people from coronavirus using moth. Of course, we also make some of those moth filters and really install them. Since it's cheap enough, it's mass produced, we can install some of them in the subway in Beijing. And also we work with different companies actually to anchor such filter for different applications, e either from the source for the environmental pollution control or at the end, uh, for the end user uh, as an air purifier or different type of products. We're working with them. Some of them is already leased as a, as a final product already. So um, um, with that, I would like to thank all of you. And uh, if you're interested, we, are, we actually uh, wrote several um, uh, review articles, especially, especially this accounts paper actually summarize some of the membrane and the film uh, uh, work, uh, especially those different methods we introduced there. Uh, I would like to say uh, in the early days, I was only working on moth crystals, trying to grow crystals. It's my dream every day to trying to grow a big, beautiful crystals. But I realized we, we have to make it to membrane or some films, in certain cases, coatings, if we want to use it as a testing paper, want to use it as a, a fabric. So I try to actually grow those or process it to, into different membranes and films for environmental purpose. And uh, with that, uh, again, I would like to thank all of you. Um, and also I would like to thank my collaborators, Professor Fong, Professor Hu, Li, and Ma, and also my students, uh, Yifa Chen and Yuan Yuan Zhang, 
uh, who, who also uh, was a student of Omar Fahar and uh, uh, Lu Wang and uh, Shan Wang, et cetera. And here is a photo uh, taken uh, from uh, our ca campus. Actually, that's a lake on, on campus. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, all of you to visit us. Of course, uh, we're facing this coronavirus right now. I hope, I truly hope it will be gone soon. And uh, I truly hope all of us to stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Wang. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation and we will now move into the question and answer period. Uh, we've got uh, uh, some, some good time to have a nice discussion. Um, so before we get into the questions, let me just remind everyone uh, how this will go. Um, if you um, are an attendee of the conference, you can type in your questions into the, um, the, the Q&A box and those are starting to come in and uh, I will field those and, uh, and, and read those. Uh, if, if you have audio and video access uh, uh, to this conference, uh, you can uh, please um, turn on your video and unmute and you can raise your hand and I will, uh, I will recognize you and then you can ask your question and then after that we'll ask you to, to mute yourself and turn your video back off. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and, and uh, open for questions. Uh, are, are there any uh, live that uh, uh, we'd like to, to take right now? Uh, I see one from uh, Sambin. Uh, go ahead, Sambin. Please unmute yourself and uh, start your video if possible. Yes, hi, hello. Hi, Bo, it's good to see you again. Hello. Hello. Um, a very nice the, um, the presentation. I was wondering, uh, do you see differences when you actually put it on the cloth, the last part of the pack, with the with particle size in photocatalytic efficiency, if you make bigger particle versus smaller particle or medium sized particle? Well, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, we observed the difference actually. Uh, it, the, the, the photocatalytic process actually very, um, uh, very uh, in, to some extent actually, the smaller the particle, the photocatalytic process actually uh, goes, um, uh, at least the kinetic actually goes faster. And also we analyze the, uh, we actually learn from other people's work. It's actually a established um, uh, theory there. Basically you are actually uh, for the uh, for for the for the carrier separation processes will be easier if, if you make the particle size smaller that way, but in this case uh, we have to pay more attention, especially in some MOF case we have to pay a, much attention to this leaching problem, because if you make the particle small enough, the morphology uh, or I should say the purity of the MOFs cannot be guaranteed. In certain cases some metal leaching can be a problem. That's why in this case, we only focus on some of the rather benign MOF, for example, ZIF, uh, ZIF-8, and then we, we, we tested many different zinc MOFs and uh, aluminum MOFs just to make sure those metal by themselves are not toxic enough to kill the bacteria. In, the, in that case, we have to, well, just balance out the, the, the process, but you are, you are right. We have to analyze closer, uh, give a closer look into the, 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 the whole process, especially regarding the particle size. So, so let me ask a follow-up question. Um, so you think that the particle size dependent is more like the TiO2 stuff where, you know, you, you really need the smaller particles so that the band gap, you know, you, you get more efficiently generation mm -hmm. of the, of mm -hmm. the radical. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so, so, so that is more like that because from catalysis, I can also think about saying that a smaller particle would be um, better because they have more surface area, right? So, mm -hmm. so I'm just thinking about is which probably the combination of both, but you think that the charge separation effect is actually a lot, uh, mm -hmm. a, a well, lot more. Well, uh, 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 actually, that's a good point. Actually, um, it's very, it can be very uh, complicated because the charge separation process, especially in, in MOFs by themselves, 
uh, can be relatively easy because you have those pores and the charge cannot be easily jumped from ligand to metal, metal to ligand in certain cases. So it can be separate on the interface or through the, 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 near, the, near, the near the pocket that way. So um, you're right, e even the band structure calculation can be suspicious in, in MOF cases. Um, that's also my uh, question in the end. I, uh, I was consulting with many um, uh, catalysis uh, people and asking them for their suggestion. But especially in this case, I'm not very confident using the traditional uh, band gap calculation method, given the fact that MOF by themselves are not kind of a, you know, pure phase homogeneous, all the way metal oxide, all the way polymer case. In, in, in MOF case can be very, very different. So uh, again, uh, I guess I didn't truly answer your question, but <laughs> I, no, no, I probably I'm give you asking, another question. <laughs> I'm just asking for your speculation because I know that this is ongoing work. So thanks very mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. yeah, good yeah, to see yeah, you yeah. online again. So. Good to see you. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you uh, Sun Ben. Um, I'm going to ask a question uh, from the, the, um, the typed questions. Uh, this one comes from Benjamin Schindel. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Professor Wong, when the MOF loses its crystallinity and precise pore structure, which enable it to capture highly specific toxins, what benefit does it then provide over more conventional adsorbents slash med, uh, membranes? Well, um, in certain cases, actually, when it, when it lost its crystallinity, and uh, in, in other words, the pore uh, structure complete, completely collapsed when it got in, in touch with some of the toxicants, I, I should say the purpose of doing such work, uh, it, it all depends on the, on the, on the uh, all, uh, I should say, e economic factors when you're comparing this to. Um, comparing to the traditional absorbent or other membranes, as long as certain MOFs, in the, for example, if you're facing very toxic, toxic species, as long as MOF can selectively capture those uh, compounds, I should say, even though in certain cases it collapse and it's one time use, I guess as long as it's cheap enough for such important and critical applications, I, 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 I should say it's justified to use MOF. But in other cases, especially in, in the, the, the ones I discussed here, uh, for example, ozone, if it's one-time use, uh, I, I, I didn't see any purpose of using MOF in this case, since ozone by themselves are, I should say, very easy to decompose. So um, it all depends on the, on, the, on the target. In certain cases, it's, I, I should say it's, it's not useful. Great, uh, thank you. Um, We'll, we'll take uh, one more question. Uh, this, uh, I, I see that uh, Franz Geiger, uh, you have your hand up. Uh, Franz, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, that was a wonderful talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, the question that I had was about regenerating these masks when, or, or um, washing them in detergents, et cetera, because one of the problems with wearing masks day to day is mm -hmm. that you end up getting staph infections if you don't clean them. How resilient are these uh, uh, loaded masks then to uh, regeneration? I'm sorry, uh, what was your question again? Toward the end, I lost sorry. some how, part of it. Yeah, how resilient are these masks uh, that oh, are loaded okay. with them off to, uh, for example, detergent, uh, washing mm -hmm. and oiling and um, mm -hmm. acidic acid, mm -hmm. uh, water, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Very good question. Actually, for those masks, when we were tested, tested them, uh, actually, we were not using Z8, uh, the one we, we published. We figured out very, a very simple moth. A very simple moth is rather, uh, I should say, rather stable uh, when you are working with polypropylene, which is usually the, the mask material we're using. So when we were growing uh, the, the non-woven fabric, we put the moth recipe, uh, the starting material in it, and eventually it will grow on the surface. It's rather stable in that way when you're washing it using clean water, it's still there. We wash it up to 10 times and nothing is losing out. Zinc, cations, nothing is getting out. That's but great. you're right, when you're boiling it, you're losing some of it, for sure, we yeah. test it. 
So we, when we are actually giving them to the doctor, especially the clothes, we suggest them to use it, use uh, the, the, the washer, use just cold water. Nothing, okay. you know, nothing hot, nothing, you know, detergent, nothing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, um, we are uh, at the end of our time, but uh, thank you very much, Professor Wong, for a wonderful talk and a, a nice discussion.